Acts chapter 2, 42, 47. And they, um, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple, together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. All right, so, <clears throat> so here you go. Like they devoted themselves to the scripture and then now they devoted themselves to what? To the fellowship, right? Can we all say to the fellowship? To the fellowship. And this fellowship word in English is, um, you know, it comes from the Greek word koinonia, right? We, maybe like some of us, we are very familiar with these words and what this word stands for. Koinonia actually has a lot of varieties of meaning. And then throughout the New Testament, throughout the New Testament, um, like the, the disciples or the apostles, they used this word to mean, uh, to, they used this word uh, to mean many things, right? And then many occasions. Um, for an example, like fellowship, like they use word, uh, this word fellowship, koinonia, in Acts, uh, in, in Acts over here, to mean a fellowship of in the gatherings of the people, right? Um, and mostly they used it to share, uh, for the, uh, to mean to have in common or, or to share. Right, but when you, as you read different scriptures, you will find this this fellowship word has been used to talk about communion, to have communion with God, and and with each other. All right, to have fellowship with God, Son, the Holy Spirit, and and, and with 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 brothers and sisters. Now, this word also uh, means uh, stands for intimacy. Actually, the word actually was intercourse. So I didn't put it there, but then it's, it's really the intimacy. It's really, really like intimate. Uh, the word really means like an like intimate relationship, right? Uh, the other word has, this word has been used to describe about the contribution. Many of the times like Paul used this word to describe um, about the Macedonian co uh, contribution to the Jerusalem church. Now, when you look at in the scripture, Macedonian had nothing to do with the Jerusalem church, right? But then what, one thing that tied them together was that their contribution, now when Paul talks about their contribution, has actually blessed the church in Jerusalem. And when he talks about the contribution, he talks about fellowship, right? So it's a very practical way of fellowshipping with each other and not just through words or not just uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the head. But then it's a sharing of goods, sharing with those who are in need, taking care of those who are actually um, vulnerable, and looking after those who are actually weak in the fellowship. Very practical sense of helping someone, right? Uh, looking out uh, for someone and watching out for someone. Now, it also means the fellowship also, the word has been used to communicate. Like the word also has been used to communicate someone. Uh, when you are communicating something, uh, message. So the, so the word has been used as, communi uh, as, as a means of communications, right? Now, you can see that why, why, why disciples or why this word has been used in a very variety of ways is, 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 is because um, this actually fellowship um, um, captures or, 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 or actually it means a dynamic relationship uh, within the believers. It is, it is, the fellowship is not just the gathering of the people in the, on Sunday services or, or in the fellowship time, but it is about, it talks about a dynamic relationship uh, between the brothers and sisters or, or in the church, a dynamic relationship, all right? And how we ought to have relationship with God and how we need to relate with each other in a very real way. I have put it there on the screen. As you read this, koinonia captures this idea of a dynamic relationship 
where believers grow each other mutually as they authentically share their life of Christ with one another. All right? As they authentically share their life of Christ with one another as one body of Christ, as one body of Christ, and serve each other through the ministry, through the service. So there, is, you know, there are a lot of things over there in koinonia. This, this idea of koinonia is about really having a relationship and growing each other. Growing each other. Those are weak. Growing each other. right? Mutually helping someone. Mutually benefiting each other. And, and, and not really being superficial, but then, but then really like in, in realistically or authentically sharing your life with, with other person. As one body of Christ. Because as one body of Christ, what happens when you feel something? When somebody is hurt, you feel hurt, right? If you grow, like, and the other person, you, you know, if the other person succeeds, then you also succeed. You, 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 you rejoice with that person as well, right? So there is this idea of, like, being one body of Christ, all right? And then the last one is, is very crucial. It was very important. Serving, serving, and serving each other through the ministry, like, which is called also ministry. Serving one another through the gifts, talents that God has given to us as believers. God has vested upon us. God has given you, each and every one of us, his gifts through the Holy Spirit. So when we use those gifts and share with, our, with, our, with the people inside the church and outside of the church, what happens? Then we actually begin to serve each other and we minister people through our giftings, right? So that's how koinonia is built. That's how koinonia is, 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 is found. I want to read these uh, verses in Romans 15, 26. Like this is how the, the word or the fellowship has been described. In, there are many other verses, but I just picked three, uh, three passages. Romans 15, 26 says, For Macedonia and Archaea have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So the word has been used to show their contribution, a, a very real, uh, real, uh, a realistic help in terms of money, right? First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So now here it talks about a relationship, our relationship with our heavenly father and, then, and, and, and with others. In Philemon 1.6, it talks about communication. And I, and I pray that the sharing, the sharing word, has been used as, if you look at, it, look at it in Greek, it's koinonian. Of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that, that, that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now, why I said it is a dynamic relationship, and, and I wanted us to point out uh, to this thing. If fellowship is built um, because, uh, because of this dynamic relationship, then how can we build this relationship? Then we must be paying attention to build the relationship, authentic relationship, right? Many times we pay attention to how to make fellowship happen, right? How, you know, every, everything goes, uh, everything fits together to, to, to bring every, you know, like every people uh, together. And then, of course, those things are very important. Place, um, uh, you know, like the, the organizations um, or food, you know, like the, 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 the authors and all that kind of thing goes into making that fellowship, that event, that program happen. But then how often we think about fellowship in terms of building relationship? Because essentially it is the relationship that builds the fellowship, right? And then my, 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 my prayer is, is that in our church that we are to think about very critically that how can we build relationships so that our fellowship is strengthened and developed and growing fostering, enjoying, right? And thus we see that our fellowship is koinonia in that sense. So koinonia is a dynamic relationship. To build this relationship, we need to put on love. Now this is something that we all know that love binds everything together, right? Love binds everything together. And that love is not just love of, like love has many definitions, but then a love, pure love, love that we receive and experience from Jesus Christ. The love, the, the selfless love that we have experienced as believers, of, as believers, as Christians. When we put that love into that relationship, what happens? Love actually covers multitudes of sins, right? Love, actually pure love, protects us. Actually pure, love actually casts out fear, all kinds of fear in our lives. Insecurities, right? 
If you love someone, you don't need to be actually secure, insecure. You don't need to be feeling insecure. You don't need to be overreactive or, or defensive. I think love actually captures or becomes the foundation in building this relationship. Thus, we build the, the, the fellowship of God that he's talking about in Acts. Just think about, I'm just going to go uh, very fast over here, but then just think about love. Love actually captures. Love actually is the ligament. Love actually joins everything together. Right? And, and, and many times, how much love do we put into uh, to building relationship versus how much effort we put into building relationship, right? We try to make things right. But then in those things, do we put on love? Do we act? Do we proceed? Do we think? Do we love that person? And thus you do those things. Do you, do you really love that person? Thus you, you pray for that person. Do you really love that person? Do you really love yourself? Now in John... 13, 34, 30, 36, it says that a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. All right? How will the people know that we are God's disciples? When we love one another. That's very simple. Now, the love actually becomes a foundation. And, and many times, of course, maybe like I need to love that person, but then I do not know how to love, right? Maybe I, you know, if, if you were that my, my uh, I can, like if you were my type of guy, like I would always make tea for that person to show my love. Because we didn't grow up like saying, I love you, honey. I love you, dear. Like, you know, when we cried, my mother didn't come like embracing me saying like, it's okay. It's all right. Don't cry. No, it, was, it wasn't like that. We just grew up in a very rough culture, right? And now we are coming to know that, hey, I'm so sorry for that. You know, we're just saying like, I'm glad that you succeed. I'm like, all these things we are learning right now. And it's good for us. It's good for this culture. It's good for, for our generation and for our kids, right? But there are love languages, they are love languages. But then biblically, I wanted to show you this, that how should we, and what that love actually looks like practically, right? When we go on to the next slide, um, you will see this. Um, sorry, these slides are kind of like clumsy. They are like, uh, they need to be waken up. Okay, over here. How, oh God. Just go up onto the next slide. Yes. So, as I was saying, fellowship underneath the foundation is love, right? Relationship. And relationship requires love, right? And, and, and again, again, what that love looks like practically. I mean, like when you look at, it, look at it in the Bible, that love has an expression. Like, it has, like you can express this love through these means. Now you see in, um, in all of these things, what you see is that imperatives. Imperatives is a word. Actually, it's not like you should... Maybe you may, you may be doing these things. Imperative is a command in the Bible. You should do this. It is a command that needs to be incorporated or has to have in the fellowship, right? So that love looks like this. Like this is how we should love each other. Encourage one another. Can we just read it together? Encourage one another. Encourage one another. Admonish one another, right? Admonish one another. Third, confess your sins to one another. Forgive one another. Accept one another. Serve one another. Build up one another. Be hospitable to one another. All right? I'm just going to read. Um, I want you to, I, 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 I'm going to use this word. I, I really wish and I really pray that you take this home and, and read it by yourself. There are references and just when you have your free time, whether you have you know, lunch time or whether you're in the toilet or whatever, just like, just, just, just put it out and, and, and read these passages. It is for your homework, okay? Uh, but I just want to read one. Uh, encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Now, even if I read this passage, what it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another, one another up just as you are doing. All right? So it talks about, now this is also called one another in the, in the Bible, one another theme, right? So one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, 
confess your sins to one another. Forgive one another. Accept one another. Serve one another. Build up one another. Be hospitable to one another. All right? There is a sense that we have, we, we need to grow as, as spiritually as a Christian individually, one person. We have our private life with God. Personally, we grow. But then there is this sense, there is this whole lot of, whole lot of journey that we need to do. We need to journey with one another, with the other person in the church, in the fellowship. And that's how we grow. And that's how we sow love of God, love of Christ. And how we do that by how we do that is by encouraging people, encouraging the other person. Right? Encouraging the other, speaking the, the words of encouragement to that person. Giving, giving words of life to that person. Right? And I oftentimes I'm also guilty of not really living out this. Because more than the encouraging words, my I become critical. I become sometimes even complaining, like grumbling. Why this is not good? Why this is not happening? Yeah, maybe like 80% is right, but then the 10, 20% is not good. So I talk about 20% the whole time, right? Or maybe like the 10% I grumble a lot, right? So we, uh, you, know, you know, human carnal na nature, we actually then sometimes we just need to be reminded that we need to be the people of encouragement. We need to encourage people because encouragement goes a long way, right? So just, be remind, just remind yourself, fellowship builds Fellowship can grow as we encourage one another in Christ. We can admonish one another, admonish one another by speaking the words of wisdom, helping them gently, right? Correcting them gently. And you know what? Like, you know, when you have a friend whom you can trust, if they say something to you, even if it is harsh, you take it because you trust that person, right? You cannot take someone's, someone's like, even, you know, it's a very good criticism. It's a, it's a very constructive thing if you don't have a relationship with that person, right? You cannot trust that person fully. See, even if the wisdom is coming very strong, even if that person is right in saying, like he's pointing out good things in your life, but then you cannot take it and digest it and let alone applying in your lives because why? You don't have a relationship and you cannot trust that person. And you take it as a just mental thing and you kind of become defensive, because then you think, why? Who, who thinks he is, right? She is, right? Right? So when there is a relationship on the foundation, there is easy, it becomes easier for you to take the criticism as well. Right? So that is why in the fellowship, you know, at least think about the fellowship that God has given to us. Like we talked about many missional groups in our church. You know, where we are actually putting our effort into. We put our efforts a lot, lot of times, you know, including myself, to make that fellowship happen in terms of like where to meet and how, what to do and what not to do, right? But are we putting our effort in building relationships? Are we putting more love, much love, into building that relationship? Admonishing, confessing your sins. It is a big thing. You know, there is power when we confess our sins. There is power when we confess our sins. I know for sure it is not easy. But then as we group into, like as we, if you have someone uh, with you, coming alongside with you, walking alongside with you in your journey, and you actually are, you are able to confess your sins with him, able to share with him your, your challenges, your weaknesses, then man, it becomes powerful. I have experienced in my own life when I have begun, instead of hiding my things in my life, I begin to share with one person whom I can trust. And then it gradually grows I, try, I gain trust with others as well. Then I become even more open. Then I begin to actually share my problems with other people. You know, that's where actually you cut the root out of, out of Satan's hold in your lives. As you begin to confess openly, then the, then the works of darkness, the struggles or bondages, whatever things that you're struggling, it actually cuts off from the root because you're bringing it into light. And God works. Actually, God heals as even as you confess. So there is a big, big, big element of, as a believer, why we gather together is also because we confess. And that shows our vulnerability, that we are not perfect. That we, all of us, we are the same. Like we are saved by grace. 
the grace of Jesus Christ. We all need we all need prayers. We all need help. We all need like we are all broken. We are all people. We are not none of us were hundred percent right and none of us hundred percent correct all the time. So we need each other. That's those interdependency, mutual sharing, mutual common good. That's why in Acts, it again and again it says one another, one another, one another, and then they were they shared their life in common. So they had commonality, although they had many differences, more than ours. They were from many cultural backgrounds. They were from many ethnic backgrounds. They, they, they spoke many different languages. Maybe perhaps they had more barriers to face than us, right? But then why they were able to come together is because they had in common one thing, that they knew Christ, that they had become now a new people, a new people living in a new culture, speaking in different languages. But they could actually really cross through the barriers. They could see beyond their, their differences. One, one common good is just that they could actually build each other up. They could, some, they could actually enjoy God by being, by, being, by being with each other. Forgive one another. I know that this is a big thing, and we've been told again and again, but how hard it is to forgive someone from your heart, right? I think the modern times, because we've been hearing a lot of times these messages, we just like surface in the, on the surface level, oh, I forgive you. And, oh, yeah, yeah, it's okay, no problem. But then we're still carrying that in our heart, right? I, we're still carrying that in, in our heart. And then the, the person comes up like, hey, I'm so sorry. You know, my wife actually sees very quick in saying sorry. So I'm so sorry for that. It's like, and then all of us, we nag like, how many times do you say sorry and you repeat the same thing again? You're like, <laughs> so like, it was like, okay. And then Nehemiah really wants her to be really, really sorry. With tears and everything. Sorry, say sorry. You know, so sorry. I think, you know, sometimes we just take it uh, so, like we take it for granted. Um, but I think there has to be a space for us to, to really like mourn and lament. And also, you know, the forgiveness does something. It releases blessing in our lives. It releases healing. It heals us from inside and out. And, and, and when we actually walk um, or take this, this path of, of, of rather than like choosing bitterness or, or you know, the revenge or, or, or just like a kind of like the, this, this carrying this burden on ourselves, when we accept or when we choose to forgive, then actually that releases blessing. That actually heals you, for, heals you first and foremost. And then that heals the other person, right? And I think it is so important in a, in a fellowship setting, like as we build our koinonia, that this forgiveness has to flow like a river. And we should not forget that this is, an, this is like a, like a, a event-oriented oriented things. This has to be like a culture that we need to be used to forgiving people, forgiving those who hurt us, forgiving those who harm us. Accept one another. Serve one another. Serving. I mean, like, I cannot say enough in serving because we all serve each other so violently here in this church. Right? We serve, 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 serve. And I love that. Praise God for this fellowship. Praise God that we love serving each other. Right? Serving tea, serving brooming and cleaning and all the kind of things. Serving food and, and helping each other. I think this is how it should be. This is the culture of God. That it hasn't been, I think, I don't believe that it is because we, we got it in our nature. No. No. The, the, I, I think it is very difficult to serve just like because just, just we want to serve. No. There has to be a source. There has to be a, there, you know, God has done something in our hearts that we want to serve each other. And that way we show love to the people as well. And I want to encourage you guys that as you serve and you serve and serve more people, may you never go dry. May you never feel like, oh, I'm just running out of the fuel right now. As you serve, as you give, right? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Right? I remember like the word says that even if you give a cup of water in my name, you will certainly not lose your reward in heaven. Remember that your reward is in God. God is the one who rewards you. God is the one who is sitting there and looking at you and saying, wow, that's great, man. Nobody is looking at you. That's wonderful. One day I, I recognized like, the same thing uh, when uh, Didi Kalpana was not here. And nobody was here actually because we were just forming the church. And then I had to come in the morning and broom the uh, the church and uh, clean the toilet and and I feel like this sense of like not feeling like oh why you should be doing all these things this kind of things you know like I feel this like sense of gratitude in my heart that God I'm in the house of the Lord that I have this privilege to work privilege to serve you God this way and serve people 
And I just started tearing and crying because then it was a, it, I felt that there was this joy overwhelming, this overflowing in my heart because, because that I could actually be part of, the, of God's plan, part of God's work, right? And I think that when we serve each other, we should be reminded that God's, first, first and foremost, God's heart is gladdened. And He's the one who's going to reward you. He's the one whom you're actually working for and working, working and serving. And as you serve God, you serve people. You bless the community. You build the fellowship. Build up one another. Be hospitable to one another. Now we know that as we, as we continue in our, uh, in our, um, in our faith, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, faith, we encounter a lot of the hurdles, a lot of the tests and trials, don't we? Right? We face trials. You know, sometimes we face like fellowships just like not growing. What's happening? Right? You know, effort, like regardless of the effort, like you're putting into it. Praying and asking, encouraging, but nothing is happening. What's going on? God, would you help me, God? I'm at the verge of giving up, God. What could potentially keep us from growing in the fellowship? Right? Or I can use the words like even destroy or divide our fellowship, right? But what could potentially keep us from growing in the fellowship, from being in this koinonia or enjoying this fellowship or growing, developing this fellowship in our church? Um, on to the next slide. I'm going to show you this. Um, tests and trials. I call it dormancy phase. I was running, um, I was really sick on fr Friday and I texted to, to Tina as well. I was really sick and I really wanted to rest. But then I felt like, okay, if this flu is really getting harder, it's really strong in Hong Kong, so I will just work hard, even more harder then. Let me, let me just go for exercise then. So against the flu, against my cramp, I just went on like running, very fast running. And then as I was running, I saw a guy just, you know, like using his uh, water bottle and then just putting water onto something that I didn't even see, like what he was watering on. And then as I looked at it and I saw these small plants on the, on the ways, like on the, 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 at, the, at the, the pathways, and they were like just like coming up and they were very green. But then uh, in front of all of these trees, like, they looked so tiny, so small. But then, no, but then they were there, green, just, just growing up. And somebody was actually watering them. Even like putting his own, like, you know, taking his own drink and just watering them. And that imagery reminded me of like this, this, this thing called, uh, because I love science, um, Dormancy phase, that happens uh, in, the, in, the, in the plant vegetation. Like what happens in a tree, life is, is that before the, uh, before the winter season, before the cool season, uh, the plant actually goes, uh, you know, a phase called dormancy phase, where they, they stop growing. They don't grow at all. But what they, what they do, what they does in the, during those times is, is that they, they technically actually conserve or, or preserve energy and proteins uh, and nutrients uh, to actually go through or to survive uh, through the uh, winter season, cool season, where there is dry season, where there is no rain and there is nothing, right? So now, when you apply this into our own lives, into our own fellowship, right, what happens? We go through many trials and, and tribulations, many tests and, and, and all kinds of things. Perhaps, I think, you know, we, we always, like, I always invite people to the fellowship, but then, but then many times, like, I see them, being blocked, I see them like, you know, like they're encountering something that something blocks them. And then in many times, um, when I ask questions like what's going on, and then I begin to then learn about their own life and then all kinds of things happening in their lives, you know, a whole lot of the issues. And, and then they might be going through a lot in, in their lives that, that, you know, that, that they've been not been able to make, make up. They've not been able to do this kind of thing. They've not been able to come to the church. Why? It's because like so many things happening. It's, it's barely they're managing to be able to, to stand on their feet, right? And how can they come to the church and, and worship God because they're not yet there? And many times I see people also struggle with their own sinfulness, uh, the weaknesses, challenges. They go back and forth, falling back and forth. And because of those things, now Satan comes from behind and then just like tries to always like, you know, just like playing with them and then and making them feel guilty and shameful. And then see all these games are going on in their lives and... And you expect them to, 
to grow in the fellowship and read Bible and pray and all of that, it does not happen. Kind of like the dormancy phase, like where they need the most energy and then the most rest, where they need, they need, to no, they need this nourishment from God, right, and from people. Like the way the guy was actually watering that plant, we need to water, we need to nurture the relationship. We need to nurture the fellowship, the people, individuals, those who have been going through this dormancy phase. Right? Directly saying like, oh, that person is out of the sin. I just give up on that. We need to look at it in a very close view and then see like what's going on. What's going on? And then if that person needs nurturing, we need to nurture that person. There are seasons that people need one another. People need to shoulder, someone shoulder, someone to come and lift their hands up, right? someone to come alongside and encourage them, encourage them to grow in the Lord. And that way they can experience the love of God in their lives. That way they can experience the selfless love of a brother from a church who is not just only after like bringing him in the church and filling the chairs on Sunday morning services, but then he's actually after him. He cares for him. This brother cares for me. Therefore, I can experience the love of God in my life. Now, these are some of the things, very simple. But yet, these are the things that builds the relationship. And these are the things that are the foundation of building our fellowship, koinonia, in the Lord. I was reading again the George Verwer. And then he talked about this, our attitude. Many times what throws off or what destroys our relationship is our attitude. Can we go on to that slide, please? And what he meant by our attitude is, is that many times we are overreactive to the situations. Or we are overreactive, overreactive to the other person, right? And that, that throws off, or that, actually, um, you know, that actually destroys or harms the relationship. Now, what he means by overreacting, there are the lists that he just listed out. And I'm just going to read those carefully. And if you have time, again, take the picture. You will have the notes. Just take it home and then see like, oh, yeah, I mean, like, I can see that in me. I, it's me, right? So then just ask God, Lord, can you help me? Can you help me, God, to correct myself? Can you help me, God, improve in this? So when he talked about overreacting, he said, I may be wrong. Right, that's why I over. Uh, Sometimes you, it is not good to overreact, because because you may be wrong. I may be wrong. Uh, second, it makes the other person over defensive. Third, it is fleshly, and not of the spirit. Fourth, it breaks the unity. It can hurt others. Six, it shows a wrong concept of God, forgetting that He is sovereign in control. Seven, it shows a wrong concept of man. We are made in the image of God. He or she must be handled properly. Eight, it shows impatience. Let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Nine, Christ, our example, did not overreact. Can we go on to the next slide, please? The reasons for not reacting to things. Why? Because it often reflects our fallen personalities and not biblical principles. Second, it often hurts people of opposite views without helping them. It creates an emotional atmosphere in which rational discussion and true walking in the light is difficult. It creates a series of swings of the pendulum encounter react reactions rather than finding the right balance. It makes people fearful of sharing their thoughts the next time. I, I really like that because then, you know, when you're overreactive, people, they shut down. They don't, they, they don't want to share anymore because then next time they just fear, right? So kind of like they, they, cannot, they cannot share because you're overreacting to that. It grips the Holy Spirit. It degrades the other human value. It tends to focus on the negative rather than on the positive. It can hurt our testimony to non-believers when they are present. This, this is I have repented many times. This is I have repented many times. There are other people who do not know God. And then they are always observing our attitude, right? And when we are not careful enough, paying not in, uh, enough attention in our communications, what happens? They just take that. 
They just take that and actually it destroys our relationship. An example, testimony. Right? The scars of reaction may take years to heal, if ever. And many times, if we are not careful enough in our speech, how we are communicating with the other person to the situations, and, uh, and then that leaves the scars to the people. Trauma, right? We, talk, we call it. So it, it takes a long, long time for that person to overcome all of that. Now, why I put this up there is because I, we actually can, um, as a church, as a believers, we can be sensitive to these areas and ask the Holy Spirit to help us, to guard our hearts, to guard our lips, to guard our, the way we actually act out in the fellowship. Actually, we don't remember these kind of things, right? But somehow we think that we, should, we ought to be doing these things. But here it is, in the church that God actually allows us to know these things. Why? So that Holy Spirit can allow us. Holy Spirit will allow us. Actually, he will enable us to walk the path that God has for us. The last slide actually came to my mind as I was praying. Now, all these things come as a research, a very limited research. But then this last thing comes as a prayer. Now, many times we are too careful to actually do other things. We are too careful in, prep, in, in preparation, preparing ourselves outwardly. But inwardly, we are not ready to face the Zions, right? You remember this story? When they were wanting to fight the Goliath, what they did was like they wanted to put on him the armors that, that they were wearing. But David was not, he was not used to with those armors. Like he had slingshot and then the, and then the what, lati, right? And then the staff on his hand. But what he had was more bigger than any one had. Let me ask you this question. What he had, what did he say when he was going marching against the Zion? Uh, he, <laughs> uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take any insults like, uh, Goliath was ranting about his God. So he went against him in the name of his God. Yes, in the name of his God. Can somebody just say it a little bit like, you know, what he had, you know, when he says like David, what he says. You have come here with what? Javelins and all of these kinds of things. But I have come in the? In the name of the Lord. I have come in the name of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, here is the message. Many times we look at it, fellowship, relationship, all kinds of conflicts and everything in a very physical way. And we try to solve it through our own strength and our ability, our thinking, or even our experiences. Or even we have the system of conflict resolutions. But then seldom we look at it as a spiritual factor that there is this actually the enemy who is trying to destroy our relationship, who is trying to destroy and kill and destroy and steal from us the joy of the Lord. And when we actually look at it very deeply, then God actually reminds us that we need to be ready inwardly, always be alert in God and, and be on your guard through prayers. Asking God that you need to be vigilant. Be on your knees. God, ask, Lord, can you, God, help me, God? When you have to face the giant, how will you prepare? Like, how will you stand before the giant? Yes, of course, with all of the things, the knowledge, the wisdom, and all that kind of thing is required. But I think the more important thing that we need to come in the name of the Lord for his glory and for his worship. The sole mission for David to kill that giant was to actually, actually exhort to really praise the, the name of the Lord in, the, in all the nations so that people could see, testify that he is the Lord, he is the living God. He is the God of just. He is God who loves, who practices compassion and mercy. And, and that could be the sole reason for us to have a fellowship in the church is because we want to exhort God. I want to love someone is not because because I'm a saint or I'm a monk or something like that, but I love God and God has loved me. I want to forgive that person because he has forgiven, God has forgiven me, right? No matter how many times you've been hurt, you've been spoken badly, and it has just, not just hurt, but it has been like a, now it's really enough, and you feel like aggravated, you feel angered, right? And why? 
we stand, why we act out in love, why we accept, is because, because God, because He has loved you, because He has forgiven you. And that is how we build. That is how we are, actually we grow in this koinonia, how we enjoy this koinonia, this fellowship. Let us pray. And ask God for His grace into your life. So areas where you need to come and ask God for forgiveness. And you need a careful eye in those things. And may God heal you in the areas where you have been wounded and broken. And if God is showing you the areas, then possibilities of like, Lord, I want to grow this fellowship. Then God asks God, Lord, can you help me to invest in someone, to nurture someone, to nurture this fellowship? But I need your grace, God. I need your wisdom. And if you are going through this dormancy phase where you need to rest and rejuvenate yourself, conserve your energy, then come, sit with God. Relish in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And God has something for you. He wants to fill you. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. God, we are not afraid, God of what lies there in the world. God, we are not afraid, and I am not afraid, God, because of you, Jesus, not. We come in the name of the Lord, who loves us so much, who has sacrificed himself for us. And God, I have decided to follow you, and we have decided to follow you, Jesus, not. And today, the word goes more than just I, God, but as one church, as one mind, as one body, God, as you being head, we want to say that we have decided to follow you, Jesus. And help us, God, to follow you through thick and thin. Help us, God, to build each other up. Help us to stick to each other and encourage one another, God, for your glory, for your worship.